This week we're going to read from the books of Amos and Jonah, which gives us an excellent opportunity to look at what is the category, the type of literature that we have in the last 12 books of our Old Testament, and also to put them into some historical context. When I was growing up, I was shown uh, this pie chart uh, with the various sections of the Old Testament, uh, beginning with the Pentateuch and then moving on to the historical books, then uh, to the poetic books like the Psalms and Proverbs, to the major prophets, and then finally uh, last and usually treated as least were the minor prophets. And this always bothered me for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it's confusing. What kind of miners are we talking about? Uh, certainly it's not the kind of miners who are working here in the picture deep in the grounds, under the ground in South Africa. And yet it's, it's still confusing. It makes it sound like uh, these prophets are not as important, that they're minor in importance. And that is not at all the case. They, were, of course, were called minor prophets simply because they were shorter in content than, well, the major prophets. There's a new title uh, for this section of the Bible, and it's interesting because the new title really is the ancient title. Scholars now call this section the Book of the Twelve. Now, this is what the ancient Hebrews called uh, this section of Scripture, and so it's a good place for us to turn to a more appropriate and more elevated term for uh, these great books, which have a lot of power and a lot of significance. Uh, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, uh, treats these 12 books as one book. Uh, there's only one book title, although every once in a while it's kind of like a new paragraph or a new um, phase, there is uh, the listing of the new author. But to treat it as one book, it's um, one scroll in most of the ancient Hebrew collections. And so there's this sense that these 12 writings, and often in the Jewish literature they're called individually writings, and then a book as the whole of the 12. And so this gives us an interesting perspective because it, it speaks to the unity of the Book of the Twelve. Now, the unity is not built upon the nationality uh, because uh, some of the writers were from Israel and others were from Judah at a time when those two nations did not get along very well. Um, they're not unified in who they were written to. Some were addressed to Israel, um, some to Judah, other to pagan countries like Assyria. And certainly, they are not unified in, in the station of life from which they are written. That the writers, um, some of the writers were court paid officials who were spent all the time in the face of the king. Others were, were farmers who very rarely, if ever, saw the king. And so the unity is not built upon the nationality, the destination, the, or, uh, the origin, or even the type of people who delivered the messages. Rather, the, the unity of the Book of the Twelve is that these men were sharing the same task and the same message. They all were speaking for God and they gave equally grave warnings, interspersed with some glimmers of hope and always God's promise. But they were sharing the same task and the same message and there's a unity and we should be looking for the unity in these twelve writings by the twelve writers of the Twelve, as much as we would their dissimilarities, their differences. The unifying theme may be the Day of the Lord. And certainly if you wanted to come up with a different unifying theme, it would be interesting to see your justification of that, and you might have a very good idea. But many of the Book of the Twelve describe the Day of the Lord, which for the most part is the Day of Punishment. It's a Day of Punishment for Israel, it's a day of punishment for Judah, and it's a day of punishment for the Gentiles, which are called the nations. So here we need to take a short time out for politics. 
not politics of today's age, but politics of the period which is 600 to 400 BC. During the time of the prophetic books, Israel and Judah are not the same. Israel represents the ten tribes who separated during Rehoboam's range, reign, and they had their capital in a city called Samaria. They were the northern kingdom. Judah represented the two southern tribes with its capital in Jerusalem, much smaller and yet usually more powerful politically, and that swayed back and forth. These two countries fought against each other quite a bit. Very rarely during the time of their divided kingdom were they really on good terms with each other. And so Israel and Judah is not the same. They're, they're two different things. And when we read to Judah, we should read, oh, okay, this is written to the northern kingdom. And it does not include Judah. And then vice versa when something is addressed to Judah. We've seen that in the book of Amos. So here's the divided kingdom. There is Israel in the north, which is a much larger area with its capital of Samaria. And then there is Judah in the south, a smaller area with its capital in Jerusalem. And one thing that should, you should see right away is how close Jerusalem is, just a few miles from the international boundary with the nation of Israel, which created all sorts of problems for Jerusalem. So the prophets often refer to the nations, which you should remind yourself whenever you see that, that's not just saying a bunch of other political entities. Rather, it is the same word for the Gentile, the Gentiles. It's a religious term almost more than it is political. Um, a similar phrase for us today in our churches might be unbelievers or, or even the godless. And until just recently when pagan took on a different uh, specific phrase, but when I was growing up we used the word pagans to talk about people who had really no love for God, no even understanding of God. Today unbelievers or godless would work and it describes the same kind of feeling that the writer of the Twelve the books of the Twelve, and the major prophets as well, the kind of feelings and kind of relationship they had towards the people they called the nations. Those are the Gentiles, those are the people outside of God's family of faith. And so as we look at the, the day of the Lord, we see that God will punish his people, but also all people. Publish the people, publish, punish the people of faith, and punish the people who have no faith. In so doing, God is reestablishing his sovereignty. That the story, kind of the backstory behind the prophets is that for hundreds of years, it had looked like the people of faith, as well as the people around them, had gotten away with flagrant violations of God's rule and had never had to pay the consequences. The prophets say, wait a minute, God's still in charge and on the day of the Lord, he's going to demonstrate how much he still is in control and how much he weighs good and evil and consequences for them in his hands. And so the big picture for interpretation is that the 12 writings in the book of the 12 are connected by message. As we look through Zephaniah and Habakkuk and Hosea and Joel and the like, we should be thinking, what is the one message the one message which was delivered in different times by different men, by different two different nations, and through all sorts of different circumstances. Through all of those differences, what is it that's the unifying message which is being delivered by those faithful servants of the Lord? And if Sweeney is right, then the real big question to say is from each of the book of the twelve. What is the new lesson, the new aspect, the new facet, the new dynamic of God's sovereignty? Who is he sovereign over? How does he exercise his sovereignty? What are the obstacles to his sovereignty? And so as you're going through Zephaniah and Habakkuk, you might be looking at, you know, what am I learning 
about God's sovereignty as in reading through this one of the books of the Twelve. So here are the works that I cited for the, the part. Uh, the Dictionary of the Old Testament Prophets is a wonderful resource. It's practically brand new and has some great and helpful information. If you have a chance to buy this or even to browse it in our library, I think that you would be blessed for having done so.